Okay, everyone, it is two o'clock and I do appreciate everyone for joining today. Uh, we are here again for another edition of Equidox Webinar Wednesdays. Uh, today, this week, or this month rather, we're gonna be talking about what you need to know about DOJ Digital Accessibility Guidance in 2022. Uh, as always, uh, we do encourage you to reach out to us if you'd like to discuss any of the topics in more detail. Uh, and if you'd like to set up maybe a personal demonstration of our Equidoc software, maybe talk about um, some PDF remediation services that you may need, please feel free to reach out to us at any time at equidoxsales at onyxnet.com. Our website is also www.equidox.co. So there's plenty of information there about us and different ways of contacting us. Uh, and you can also reach out via phone at 800-664-9638. So before getting started, uh, as always, I just want to quickly mention our parent company, Onyx Networking. Uh, Onyx is headquartered in Cleveland, Ohio. We've been in business for over 28 years now um, with uh, basically we are a, a, cl a cloud consultancy, primarily known for being a Google premier partner. We're also partnered with Amazon Web Services, and our mission is to improve organizational efficiency through cloud computing solutions. Now, Equidox, the reason that we're here today to talk about uh, more uh, accessibility focused topics, Equidox is a best in class PDF remediation software. We offer PDF remediation services as well. So for any organizations that uh, don't have the technical background or the bandwidth to remediate documents on your own, we can do that for you. Uh, we also offer expert accessibility services in lines with different consulting and web testing uh, the PAC completion, so on and so forth. Uh, and our mission is to ensure that digital information reaches everyone through accessibility solutions. This is just a quick sampling of some of our customers. So I'm just gonna let this slide run with their logos. <clears throat> And uh, today um, on, on the webinar, so anyone that has joined these webinars in previous months, you're probably familiar with me. My name is Dan Toletta, I'm a sales engineer, but I have a co-presenter today with me, uh, Tammy Albee, who is a content marketer here on the Equidox team. And she's formerly of the National Federation of the Blind. So she comes to us with a wealth of experience and she's gonna be um, kind of working through the majority of the presentation today and passing it back over to me. So um, Tammy, with that said, I'm gonna jump to the next slide and I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Dan. Great to be here. Looking forward to reviewing this topic with everyone. Um, so I did work for the National Federation of the Blind for four years. Um, I worked in the NFB Newsline Department, which is a free newspaper service for uh, people with print disabilities. So people who are blind or visually um, impaired or who have strokes or uh, learning disabilities, uh, any eligible person uh, can use that service to access hundreds of newspapers all around the country. Um, and so that was my main job there. But, you know, when you're working with the National Federation of the Blind, you become involved in all of their initiatives. And uh, one of the biggest things that they do is uh, lobbying and advocacy for disability rights, um, specifically for uh, the blind, as they would refer to themselves as the blind. Um, so. I spend a lot of time, um, you know, learning about that sort of thing. And as these uh, new developments are happening with the Department of Justice, it kind of brought back to me the memories of when I worked there and the kinds of things that we experienced um, in the organization, uh, trying to get um, more specific legislation passed for digital accessibility for everyone. Um, so uh, this slide shows you, uh, you know, the increase in digital accessibility lawsuits over the last, you know, five or six years, 262 in 2016, jumps to 814 in 2017, 2,314 in 2018, another big jump. Uh, despite the pandemic in 2019 and 2020, there were 20, uh, 2,890 in 2019 and 3,550 in 2020. And last year uh, in 2021, there were 4,055 digital accessibility lawsuits um, these are, you know, an increase um, that just doesn't seem to be stopping. Uh, people are continuing to have issues um, with digital accessibility, and it seems that a lawsuit is sometimes the best way to get their um, concerns addressed when they cannot access information on someone's website or via their digital information or other content like documents or social media or emails. Uh, you can go to the next slide, Dan. 
So some of these um, organizations that are being sued may surprise you. Um, it's a lot of really well-known organizations. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the landmark cases of Winn-Dixie, which was one of the first, Domino's Pizza, which has been going back and forth for the last several years. Um, lots of uh, different decisions in different courts about Domino's Pizza. Um, most recently, the uh, Supreme Court declined to hear the case, feeling that it had already been addressed um, in the district court. Um, but also organizations like Amazon, Beyonce, um, several banks uh, like JP Morgan, Bank of America, TD America Trade, um, and American Express, and quite a number of various educational entities, including testing organizations like the Law School Admissions Testing, Certified Public Accountant Exam, um, and literally hundreds of colleges and universities around the country have been sued because they did not provide adequate access to their digital information, either on their website or through their documents. Um, next slide, please, Dan. So, you know, the question is, why are there so many lawsuits about digital accessibility? And the reason is that there aren't federal guidelines specific enough for non-government entities to handle the questions that organizations are asking um, about digital accessibility. People don't know what they are supposed to be doing. Um, you know, if you look at the built environment, there are many very specific specifications for buildings. Um, you know, ramps, bathrooms, parking spaces, how high the counters are supposed to be um, in a retail organization, you know, how many bathrooms, the measurements of everything, all that is very specified for the built environment. But for digital accessibility, there really aren't any published guidelines for public entities. Um, so you can go to the next slide, Dan. So it's not that there are no published guidelines at all. Under the federal law, accessibility laws, you have the, they're sort of divided into two sections. You have section 508, and that applies to federal employees or members of the public who need to access government information and communication technology. There are lots of specific regulations under section 508 um, about what digital accessibility is supposed to look like. However, Section 508 does not apply to public entities. That is covered under the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, which states that no one is supposed to be discriminated against for um, any lack of ability or you know, many other things um, related to disability. Um, but there aren't any regulations under the ADA um, that specify what digital accessibility is supposed to look like. Uh, next slide, Dan. So because of this lack of information about, you know, what digital accessibility means to the federal government, there's been a lot of complaints um, from public organizations to Congress, to the Department of Justice. There's been a lot of correspondence back and forth about this, people asking for clarification. Um, and this lack of clarification is what is resulting in so many lawsuits because they don't know what to do. So you know, they either don't do anything or they do the best they can. And then someone complains. And because there's no clear regulation, the law has to be interpreted by the court. Um, so recently, um, there was some correspondence back and forth to the Department of Justice, and we'll get to that in a little more detail later. Um, but after years of not saying anything specific, most recently, the Department of Justice released a statement that says, we've heard the calls from the public on the need for more guidance on web accessibility, particularly as our economy and society become increasingly digitized. This guidance will assist the public in understanding how to ensure that websites are accessible to people with disabilities. People with disabilities deserve to have an equal opportunity to access the services, goods, and programs provided by government and businesses, including when offered or communicated through websites. Uh, and this was released by Assistant um, Attorney General Kristen Clark. Uh, she's part of the Justice Department Civil Rights Division. Um, next slide, Dan. So what does compliance with um, the Americans with Disability Act require? According to the Department of Justice, digital accessibility is a little bit flexible so that it will allow um, organizations to include current and emerging technology. They have said um, in various um, correspondence over the years that 
you know, they didn't necessarily want to pinhole everything because there was so much new technology coming along and they wanted organizations to, you know, have the flexibility to make their websites look like they wanted to and didn't want everything to be all templated and look the same. Um, that's kind of the impression that's given by um, some of the correspondence back and forth with them. Um, so they kind of say accessible digital resources means the information should be usable with many different tools and many different technologies and how you provide that is up to you. Um, and their recent guidance uh, does refer to Section 508 regulations, which, as I said before, are specified for federal agencies and government websites. Um, and they also refer to WCAG, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, uh, what that means. Um, so those are the regulations that they are referring to without specifically saying, this is what you're supposed to do. Um, next slide, Dan. <coughs> so I think most of you probably know, but why is digital accessibility important? So as we've seen, there are thousands of digital accessibility lawsuits every year. So that definitely is potentially a going to affect every organization um, that has a website or provides digital information. Um, recently, the DOJ has finally released some more specific guidance um, say, stating specifically the digital accessibility is part of the Americans with Disability Act. And they've also said um, that they are prioritizing digital accessibility compliance and they're going to be enforcing that. Um, the other things that you know, we should think about when it comes to digital accessibility are that it expands your market. Um, it increases your SEO, it, uh, you know, including everyone, including people with disabilities means that you're including that portion of the population in your efforts to, you know, interact with the public using your website. So your audience is gonna, you know, expand if you're including people with disabilities and they make up 20 to 25% of our population. So that's not a small piece of, the uh, audience to be excluding. Um, that's quite a number of people that you can be reaching when your digital accessibility is compliant with um, the Americans with Disabilities Act. And naturally, of course, it is the right thing to do. You know, we don't want anyone to be left out. Um, we don't want to exclude anyone from, you know, access to whatever our website is providing. Everyone should be included. Everyone should have access to the same information, um, you know, that, that everyone gets. Um, next slide, Dan. So accessibility isn't just for people with disabilities as well. Um, you know, there are about 20 to 25 percent of the population has permanent disabilities like blindness or low vision. Um, they could have deafness or hard of hearing. This includes mobility issues, chronic health issues, learning disabilities. Um, but there are also, you know, temporary disabilities. You know, if you have an injury or an illness that might cause you to have a hearing or a sight loss or mobility issues, um, you know, you could find yourself, you know, having difficulty accessing digital information. Um, you know, I, I had a issue with one of my contact lenses and I wasn't able to, you know, wear them for a couple of days. And, you know, I found myself using the accessibility features on my phone because it was just easier than squinting at the tiny screen when I couldn't wear my contacts. Um, you know, and then there's other, you know, times when digital accessibility comes in handy. Um, you know, in the built environment, you know, if you're carrying a heavy load, you might really like to be able to use that ramp or an elevator, um, you know, or if you're on a noisy bus, you know, you, and you want to look at a video, you may not want to have the sound on it, you know, you won't be able to hear it, and maybe you don't want people to know what you're looking at. Um, so digital accessibility comes in handy for all of us. Um, and I think it's important to also remember uh, that digital accessibility, um, or all of us are aging into disability. As we get older, you know, it becomes harder to see. Some of us are losing our hearing. Um, and if it hasn't happened to you now, it may in the future. Um, so digital accessibility is something that will be and can be for everyone, not just people who have permanent disabilities. Um, so I think it's really good to keep that top of mind. You know, you never know who is going to need access to that information in an alternate fashion. Um, so you want to you know, really keep that top of mind when you're building your websites, when you're building your digital documents and make sure that everyone in every situation um, is able to access. Um, next slide, Dan. Um, so when I worked at the NFB, you know, I'd spend a lot of time reading all the old historical articles and um, 
you know, the materials that um, were kept um, as records at the NFB um, and the, the journey to getting the Americans with Disabilities Act signed um, is quite a storied one. Um, you may find some interest in looking back through some of those NFB records um, to look at that. Um, but in 1990, um, President Bush signed the Americans with Disabilities Act into law. Um, and it says, among other things, that it prohibits discrimination against people with disabilities in several areas, including employment, transportation, public accommodations. Uh, and that's really important because that's one of the things that digital accessibility can refer to. Um, if your website is a public place, and many courts have said that it is, then the Americans with Disabilities Act covers that as part of public accommodations. It also covers communications and access to state and local, local government programs and services. Um, and so that last bit um, also refers back to Section 508, um, you know, that government entities need to uh, make their digital content accessible to everyone. Um, and in this left-hand picture, you can see um, a number of people with disabilities. They were protesting at the Capitol um, and lobbying for this law to be signed. Um, and some of them abandoned their wheelchairs and crawled up the steps to the Capitol. And I don't know if you've ever been there, but it's a lot of steps. Um, and it was summer, so it was probably very hot there. There's not a lot of shade. Um, so they were pretty determined to be heard. Um, and this is one of the ways that they protested. And the right-hand picture shows President Bush with several representatives uh, signing the law. Uh, and Dan, we can go to the next slide. So uh, we mentioned WCAG a little bit earlier. Uh, WCAG is the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, and it was developed by an international group of experts uh, all around the world. It is made up, um, uh, it, it was developed by the World Wide Web Consortium, which is made up of a number of organizations around the world who all uh, are members and help work together to build um, these web content accessibility guidelines, and they're updated periodically. Um, uh, but the four main um, ideas that WCA covers are that all digital content should be perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. And if you have some interest in that, there's a lot of information on our website about WCAG and what perceivable, operable, and understandable uh, look like. Um, so if you're interested in that, you can take a look at our website and, you know, get a little bit more information. Uh, next slide, Dan. So uh, I'm not going to go through the entire history. Um, when we originally built this deck, it was much longer and we decided it was a little bit long. Uh, so um, those of you who can see the slide, there's a number of underlined items on this. When you get the slide deck after this webinar, um, all of those underlines connect to different articles with more information or source material for these um, these items. Um, so you can take a look at those um, if you want some more information, but I'll just read through this really quickly. In 2019, so that was a couple of years ago, there are a number of rising lawsuits, which we saw in the beginning of the presentation, incur spurred 103 Congress people to write to the Department of Justice and request digital accessibility guidelines. And the DOJ responded with a letter saying, you know, just generally, the Americans with Disabilities Act applies to places of public accommodations. We talked about a little bit earlier. And then last year, um, several other Congress people proposed the Online Accessibility Act in Congress. Um, you can read a little bit more about that um, in that article. Um, but that particular law was not supported by disability organizations because one of the things that the Online Accessibility Act was aiming to do was to reduce the number of lawsuits. Um, you know, organizations were complaining that there were too many lawsuits, they were spending a lot of time doing, dealing with those. Um, but the disability organizations didn't want this act to go forward because what the act did was it set up a resolution system for um, complaints um, that delayed the um, ability to file lawsuits until after this system of resolution was gone through. But it was very lengthy. It could be as long as six months before they'd even be able to file a lawsuit if their concerns were not addressed. So uh, that act has not been uh, signed into law. I believe it has been tabled or lost in committee, um, but it is you know, still on the books you know, to be looked at by Congress at some point. Um, now this year, um, the American Foundation for the Blind, which is not the same as the 
National Federation of the Blind. It's another um, blindness organization, um, but along with them and 180 other disability organizations, including the NFB, uh, sent a letter to the DOJ requesting digital accessibility regulations. They, you know, stated that, you know, it had been a long time and these had been promised, which they had been, um, and they'd even been worked on um, by many organizations, including the NFB. I can remember when I worked there, the team that was helping to draft um, suggestions for what those regulations should look like, um, but they were withdrawn in 2017, so they never passed. Um, so this uh, group of organizations this year um, you know, sent another letter requesting the regulations. So the Department of Justice responded almost immediately. I think it was the very next week, which was pretty quick as far as government goes. Um, and they responded with this guidance that uh, refers to Section 508 um, and Section 508 regulations incidentally include references to WCAG 2.0 AA. Um, and again, that guidance affirms that digital accessibility is covered under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, next slide, Dan. So what they said about the WCAG and 508 standards was existing technical standards provide helpful guidance concerning how to ensure accessibility website features. These include web content ten accessibility guidelines, which are WCAG, and the Section 508 standards, which federal government uses for its own website. Um, so if you're interested in more information there, there's some links here that'll be in the slide deck that'll be sent around after this webinar. Next slide, Dan. And again, they've stated they will continue to enforce the ADA. The department is committed to using its enforcement authority to ensure website accessibility for people with disabilities and to ensure that the goods, services, programs, and activities the business and state, local governments make available to the public are accessible. Um, and these three links are some examples of uh, enforcement that they have completed. Um, so if you're interested in looking at those, there's some links there. Again, there will be in the slide deck. Uh, one is Project Civil Access. The other is an H&R Block case. And there's another case called Peapod. There are several other cases um, related to um, this enforcement um, in these other materials if you follow these links. Next slide, Dan. Um, so another thing to keep in mind um, is even though the federal guidance is still not as specific as we would like, um, many states have their own specific accessibility laws. Um, they can vary from state to state, and everything is still covered under the Americans with Disabilities Act, but many states reference WCAG and or 508 guidelines. Many have financial penalties for non-compliance. And if you are doing business in a state, even though it is not your state, you still have to follow their accessibility laws. So it behooves you to know the accessibility laws for the states in which you are doing business, as well as the state in which your business exists. Um, and if you need to know more information about that, um, we have also built a rather extensive um, accessibility regulations guide. It's divided by state, and that link will be in the slide deck as well, or you can find it on our website. Next slide, Dan. Um, so again, these are some additional guidelines outside the United States, in Canada, the European Union, United Kingdom, and Australia. All of these links are live. They will be in the slide deck um, as well. Um, so if you need more information about those, if you're doing um, business in Canada or any of these other areas, um, these laws also will apply to your business. Um, and these are all digital accessibility laws. Next slide, Dan. So what should you be doing? You know, we, we have slightly less vague guidance from the Department of Justice and a clear mission to enforce the Americans with Disability Act. So what is it that your organization should be doing? So first thing you should do is find out what laws apply to your organization. Obviously the ADA does. You should find out about state laws in your area. Um, you should be, if you are upper management um, or if you are not upper management, you should be encouraging um, your corporate leaders, organizational leaders to primor prioritize and promote accessibility. It should be part of your organizational culture. Um, it should be just sort of how you do business every day. Um, it would be helpful to develop an accessibility statement um, that talks about what accessibility looks like for your organization. Uh, you want to evaluate your current websites and all of your digital resources and make sure they're accessible. You want to train your staff um, so that they're producing um, accessible content and fixing any that isn't. 
Um, and of course, you want to remediate any content um, that isn't accessible um, and make sure that as things are changed and updated and edited, um, accessibility is still included. Um, and, you know, if necessary, you, you can delegate access, accessibility tasks through your organization. Maybe you assign someone per department. Uh, maybe everybody has to be responsible for their own stuff. Maybe you need an accessibility coordinator. Um, if you're not sure how to address this, please contact us. We are happy to help you figure out the best way to set that up for your organization, um, depending on your size and how things fit together, what your normal workflows are. Uh, there are a lot of different ways to address that, and we're happy to help you with that. Um, and additionally, you should always continue to provide ongoing accessibility training on new technology and new tools. Um, you know, spend some time picking tools that are going to save you time and be available for as many of your staff as possible. Um, and I think that's a really good segue. I'm going to hand this back to Dan now because one of the reasons that Equidus exists um, is to provide accessible PDF files. Um, so back to you, Dan. Great. Thank you, Tammy. Um, so we only have a few minutes left, so uh, I will be talking rather quickly through the remaining slides, but I will say that we have a, another webinar that we recorded several months ago that kind of goes into this topic in a more thorough way. Um, so we will provide a link to that in the uh, inside of this slide deck uh, moving forward. So you'll all receive this after the call. Um, so many organizations, of course, use PDFs because it is a popular and a secure file type. Um, so many websites that we have audited or provided some consulting on contain thousands or even hundreds of thousands of PDFs living on a single website. Um, and even one inaccessible document can render your entire website deemed to be inaccessible. So despite the fact that you've gone through great lengths to make your website accessible, one PDF document sitting there that's untagged or very poorly tagged can leave your whole website uh, open for litigation if, if a user is trying to access it. Um, so PDFs also may have many different content creators. Um, so that can lead to a ton of inconsistencies in the way that they're designed and published, uh, which can make them a challenging format for sure to deal with. Uh, but we, what we do know is that every PDF needs to be accessible. So if you have PDFs floating around on your website or on your intranet or on your content management system in any way, uh, they do need to be accessible for not only your employees, but also for anyone that might be visiting your sites. So this is what I was referring to earlier, where we do have a full webinar uh, regarding the steps to PDF accessibility. So um, where do we start in terms of uh, addressing our PDF accessibility challenges? The first thing you want to do is assign a staff. Uh, you want to evaluate the scope of the project, create a written plan um, that you can adhere to and, and kind of enforce throughout your organization. Prioritize the documents, uh, typically starting with the most uh, frequently uh, interacted with documents and then also working through the newest documents and the easiest to remediate, um, kind of going through the prioritization of those documents can get you, can, can get you started um, and get you through the bulk of the work in the shortest amount of time. Uh, you also wanna choose a tool or a vendor. So if you're going to outsource that document, uh, to the documents to be remediated by professionals, or if you'd like to bring a software tool into your organization to assist you to self-serve remediate um, and get people using that tool on a regular basis. Um, then once you've chosen a tool or vendor, you of course need to remediate the documents and then validate the documents. So confirm that they are in fact accessible, that things were not overlooked. And then it's from there, it's just general maintenance. So constantly doing the upkeep that's required, any new content that's being produced, um, anything that you're introducing to your website, just making sure that it is also accessible before you post it and instead of undoing a lot of work that you've already done. Um, so PDF remediation, there's a lot that goes into it. Just at a high level, there's important things called tags, and these tags are identifying headings, links, uh, applying alt text for images, tagging lists, tables, fillable form fields, and also adjusting the reading order. So we can talk more in detail about that uh, during like maybe a product demonstration if anyone is interested in chatting more. Um, so Equidox is, of course, our best-in-class PDF remediation software. Uh, we, uh, we aim to make it easier, faster, and just in general better. Um, so we automatically can detect PDF elements. We have a lot of artificial intelligence powering our table detector and our list detector. Uh, we can also remediate PDF forms. We can add alt text to images in one location. 
We have an HTML preview and compliance warnings to really assist the user. And even if you're a novice remediator, you can uh, remediate documents with confidence knowing that you've done things correctly. Um, and also, because it's a web-based application, you're able to collaborate on larger and more complex documents. So if you need subject matter experts or if you need to work through it as a team through a document, you certainly can do that with Equidox. Um, so we do offer Equidox software licenses and we work on a concurrent user licensing model. We offer organization-wide licenses. So if you want to deploy this across your entire company, you can. Uh, training and support is included with the purchase of licensing. And we also offer a, um, an on-premise version. So primarily Equidox is a cloud-based application, but if cloud security is a challenge for your organization, we can deploy this on-premise so you can keep everything inside your own four walls operating on your own network. Uh, we also offer professional conversion services. So we have a team of expert PDF remediators. Um, so if you'd like to talk to us about that, feel free to send us documents uh, or just request a quote. We will upload those documents or you can send them to us. We will remediate the documents inside of Equidox. And then we put it through a rigorous multi-step validation process, including using screen readers to replicate how a blind individual would interact with that document. Uh, and then we return the documents to you and they are fully accessible, fully compliant, ready to be posted back to your website. Um, and the pricing for that servicing model is uh, it's based on three different parameters. So volume, uh, how many documents are we talking about and how many pages in those documents? That's a big, uh, that's a big factor, of course. Uh, the complexity, are they very complex documents? Or are they more simple like PowerPoints or just Word documents? Uh, and then the, the delivery also matters too. So if you need a document returned to you uh, within the next few days, that can impact the price versus if you don't need it back for several weeks or even a month or two. Um, just all these different factors kind of get um, blended in to determine the pricing for the services. But please feel free to reach out to us uh, if you have any questions or would like to talk to an account manager about how that works. Uh, the typical workflow is, uh, of course, documents are submitted. We set deadlines uh, and the procedures are agreed upon. Uh, a system for the document transfers is between the two parties is developed. So if you want to send it to us via Google Drive or even um, in some sort of FTP transfer, uh, document center are remediated, validated, and returned to the customer. Uh, but then oftentimes we have a lot of customers using a hybrid model. So I mentioned the software before as well as the services. So if you'd like to um, use the software internally to remediate as much as you possibly can on your own, and then you can send us the documents that are maybe more complex uh, they have a short turnaround time or if you have a large backlog that you just don't want to commit the team and the resources to working through you can always work with us and let our team handle that for you um, and in the final slide deck that we send around there is there will be a video link in here about how our equidox pdf software works so if you'd like to take a look at that this is just a short uh, 10 minute or so video to give you a high level understanding of how the, the software and the workflow that goes into it in terms of remediating documents yourself and how that operates. But please feel free again to reach out to us and uh, ask us for a separate, it looks like we are playing it on accident here. There we go. Um, now, if, um, and just, you know, just kind of wrapping things up here in the interest of time, I know that we are a couple minutes over. So I do, I do apologize for, for going over today and I uh, just want to be respectful of everyone's time. But again, please feel free to reach out to us at Equidox Sales at onyxnet.com. Our website is www.equidox.co uh, or we can re be reached at 800-664-9638. Now we're also very active on LinkedIn uh, and in all the social media networks really. So please feel free to connect with us on there to, to, to hear the updates on Equidox and our team and what's going on. Uh, we would love to interact with you, so please feel free to reach out. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. We'll see you next month. Thanks, Dan. Have a good Thanks, afternoon, Dan. everyone.